Welcome everyone. Today is February 25th, 2024. For those of you joining us via video, if you believe that Christ died on the cross, forgave all sin, and now by accepting that you have eternal life, then congratulations. We have the same belief. So for you gathered here today, ask questions as you always do. Uh, today we are February 25th. We are the, at the end of the Ages to Come series. So we've had five, the past five, uh, uh, four, now this one being the fifth. Um, this is our last part of the Ages to Come, the things that are going to happen in the future. Well, the last one is called Eternal Life. Okay, so a brief overview of what the previous four were, the seven-year tribulation, the, the day of the Lord, or when He returns, right after the seven-year tribulation and right at the beginning of the thousand-year everlasting kingdom, then the day of God, or what most people would call the white throne judgment, and today, what happens after judgment? Eternal life. Eternal life. All right? So, from our time frame, you have uh, handouts here downloaded online, but we are really just dealing with, okay, here was time past, here is us in the mystery, here is ages to come. So our five, seven-year tribulation, day of the Lord, uh, a thousand-year kingdom, day of God, and now, boom, eternal life. Okay? So that's where we are today. And this is going to be a really good study, just saying. All right, a little bit of review. Um, I put this on the screen, and for everybody else, you don't have it in your handouts, but um, um, what was the, where, where did we just come from last week? The day of God it is the last day of this heaven and this earth. It's also known as a number of other days, the last day, the white throne judgment, the day when the spirits of devils gather, um, dispensation of the fullness of times. We're going to get into that because we're right at the edge of both of those. But it talks about the, the Jews and how they're a part of gaining this eternal life. They're at the end of their everlasting life. And if that doesn't make sense to you online or to anybody, the everlasting life, an eternal life, Two completely different things, okay? And, and so we have a handout here, and we'll put it online. I didn't get it downloaded, but talking about everlasting life. But anyway, that's where we came from. So we're, we're, we're right at the last day of this heaven and this earth, okay? We are here, okay? All right, so when does eternal life occur? After the last day, and after time has ended. Eternal life is not in time. Eternal life is not measured by time. Time has ended. The last day occurred. Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. What does that mean? That means that... At the time when time is ending, the fullness of times, it's complete. He might gather in one all things in Christ. Now we're going to see this verse again, okay, a couple times more. But which are in heaven, the spiritual things, and which are on earth, the physical things. All things gathered in him when time ends. Is, can that be interpreted as... The word infinity. Um, no, because infinity is a time measurement. It's just an endless time measurement, but it still has time measurement. And I'm saying time no more. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Time began. On the, the day of God, the study before this, part four, time ended. No more time measurement. Okay, so this eternal, uh, here, just 10, Revelation 10, 6. That'll be e easy. Don't take my word for it. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and things that are therein, therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Well, now it's not my word. It's somebody else's word, <laughs> right? It's God's word. 
time no longer. And if we read in that Revelation 10, 6, although Revelation is a cyclical book, repeats itself about three or four times, is talking about this time. Time has ended. Eternal life, not measured by time. Okay? So our conclusion, I believe, and again, that's why we're here in a Bible study, not in a church, is time does not exist in eternal life. I believe that's our conclusion. So when we say, I'm going to eternal life, there's no measurement. Okay? So that at the end. Now you also notice on this timeline, which we created to anybody who's new here, whether it be on video or sitting here, everything that's inside of this box is constrained by time. Matter of fact, there, there are time here. In 4004 BC, I believe time began. Time is going to end at some point in time in the dispensation of the fullness of times. But this is all constrained by time. Everything on the outside, not constrained by time, not measured by time. So when I put God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost up here, they are outside of time. When I put the Word up here, in the beginning was the Word, Word was God, Word was with God, it's outside of time. When I put eternal life, it's outside of the box of measurement of time. These are all years here. You can see that BC and AD, the big block in there. Okay? So, if eternal life occurs after time is no longer, what is eternity? Well, lucky for us, it's not going to be a long study about what is eternity because the word eternity only appears one time in Scripture. Okay? And it appears. Isaiah 57, 15. Now read this through to me and see if this is a measurement of time. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Well, how do you inhabit a time? I think you inhabit a place. Okay, reading on. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. The high and holy place. Eternity. Okay? I could be wrong, but I think the only place that we have it... it yes, sir? Uh, well, God doesn't measure time. Like the week. Right. Uh, one day can be a thousand years. Or... Yep, with the Lord. Yep. Yeah, for Yeah, for sure. Uh, Absolutely. And that, that, is, that is exactly the point of this being outside of time, where God is. Now, of course, we're not building a hierarchy of the heavens and things like that, but by placing this outside means that you're right. Anything outside of here is not measured by time. Exactly right. I, I would concur completely. So I believe that, that uh, let's see... I believe that eternity is a place. Now, my wife was the one who found this probably 10 years ago, so we have to credit her in the fact that, that she began this, again, long or short study, but I dwell in the high and, and holy place, right? That I inhabiteth eternity. Something to think about, right? Always learning. Whether it's true or whether it's not true, at least we're trying to learn it, right? All right, so that eternity is outside. Eternal life is outside of that marker of time. So I shouldn't say since, I should say if, so we're leaving it open-minded, right? But since, in my opinion, eternity is a place, where is it? Where will we be once we have eternal life? 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but of the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. I would say earthly. But the things which are not seen, oh, are eternal. So not seen equals eternal? Something spiritual? How about 1 John 5.20? And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This 
Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So do we see a, a conclusion here? Eternal life is not seen, okay? And eternal life is in His Son, Jesus Christ. In Christ, could we even say, rather than His Son, Jesus Christ. I think we could say it. That is where eternity, eternity is, in His Son, in something not physical, not measured by time. So if we say eternal life is in His Son, Jesus Christ, could we shorten it to say eternal life is in Christ? Well, we could say it if it's in Scripture. <laughs> Let's find some verses that, that actually prove that to us. Okay? That in the dispensation, well, this is the verse we read three slides ago. Dispensation of the fullest times, he might gather together in one all things where? In Christ. In eternity. In eternal life. This is starting to build a little bit of momentum here, right? Which are both in heaven, how they are saved, whether they be saved physically through works or whether they be saved by the faith only. Okay? Even in him. Heaven and, heaven and earth is not referencing here and there. Right. Right. Yeah. So that must mean how they yeah, and I don't know if I have, I want to get to a timeline. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I demonstrate in the timeline where everything is done away and, and th something is new. Where are we? Make sure I do that, okay? How about another one in Ephesians 3.11? According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed, where is he going to have the eternal purpose? In Christ. <laughs> Colossians 1.20. To reconcile all things unto himself, to Christ. Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and the same body and partakers of his promise. Where? In Christ. I mean, just reading those words, they'll just, they just start to pop off the screen, right? And of course, I highlighted them in blue, so that helps them pop. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ. What salvation? Eternal salvation, eternal life. Where is it? In Christ, right? So our conclusion, eternal life is in Christ. I don't know, I, I don't know if, 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 if it's that simple, but I think it is. But... There are a lot of people who tell me, Keith, you, you don't understand. There's so much to know in this Bible. And when I get started in this thing, holy cow, there's 617 laws and there's all these rules. And I get that. But faith only salvation, which is our salvation, gospel of God, if that does or doesn't make sense, I'll, 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 I'll explain it. But it is, did God mean for it to be complicated? To, to be convoluted by all these distractions, by all these people telling you, you got to give this and do this and go here and mission there. and Or is it meant to be simple? I think, I, oh. He meant to give us a choice. Yeah, to give us a choice and to, to choose. And I think that 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? What's he trying? He's not trying to say the simplicity that is in understanding who Christ is. He's talking about the simple simplicity that is in eternal life, that is in this faith-only salvation. This I didn't know, because I'm not a big guy going to other books and whatnot. But in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, that's the only dictionary I use, I don't use modern day dictionaries, the word simple, from the simplicity in Christ, the word simple, and I just copy, copied and pasted this, the first two definitions of the word simple. Single, consisting of one thing. Oh, that's cool. So I believe it. 2 Corinthians was saying to us when Paul wrote that, which of course it was all God breathes at word. Now, Paul didn't know what he was writing for crying out loud. He got it through, through the Lord, right? Through, through Christ. But there, he said, 
don't miss out on the fact that this, this whole faith only salvation. Now, I understand all the works of the law. I understand what the Jews were going through. That's 613 or 617 laws that they had to keep. That was complicated. But that's called everlasting life. And he's saying, don't miss out on the simplicity of eternal life. Because everlasting life, and again, I, I handed out a handout here, but we'll get that handout online as well. The everlasting life is how do they get in, how do the Jews get into the thousand year kingdom? And holy cow, no fornicators, no adulterers, no whoremongers, no whatever else like that can get into that thousand year kingdom, okay? But we're not talking about the thousand year kingdom. We're talking about the end when our soul goes somewhere, eternal life. And it, the somewhere it goes is in Christ. And the, the simplicity of that is one thing. Okay? Eternal life in Christ is simple. What's that one thing? If eternal life is simple, how do we gain eternal life? It's supposed to be simple. It said it in 2 Corinthians, right? Simply believe. Now, this isn't the way for the Jews and following the laws, but eternal life. Simply believe you are saved through faith, not works. Should we be doing all those works? Sure. To glorify Him. But does it have anything to do with our salvation? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it doesn't. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Right? Lest any man should boast. Now, this was written in the year 62, okay? In our Bibles, on our timeline, year 62. In 48, so just a dozen years before or thereabouts, it's, there's another book in James that says, faith without works is dead, Right? Faith without works is dead. And here it says works don't matter a bit. Whew. Those are two different gospels. One is a works based and ours is simple. We're not trying to get into everlasting life. We're only trying to get into eternal life. Okay. So for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. Simple. Believe, I don't know what happened here. Believe, faith in, belief it should be. Faith in, in Jesus Christ is the only thing that gains you eternal life. Simple. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works. Used to be in the Bible. I can show you 20 or 30 verses, maybe 40, where... Works justified a man, but not now. We're in the mystery. We're in the gospel of God. We're in, uh, we can explain that later. But, but our gospel, the gospel of God, is by faith only. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Simple. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Oh, you're right. I am. Yeah, okay. So it makes sense. It was like 2 o'clock last night finishing this up. So, you know. The Apostle Paul had this long list that he was this, 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 and this. Yes. Right. You're exactly right. Yeah, he listed out the, the, his lineage and things like that. And it's interesting that the Apostle Paul, glad you brought that up, the Apostle Paul says at the beginning of Romans 1.1, 1, 1, he says he's, he's going to introduce a new gospel, this faith-only gospel. Okay, It was the only gospel given to him. And, the, and, and when it says at, at the beginning, again, of Romans 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Separated under the gospel of God. Well, now, words matter, I believe. And so when he says that he's now announcing at the beginning of Romans, he's going to be preaching the gospel of God, this simple faith only, he goes back a little bit and reflects for a few verses and, and for a few chapters. And just 15 verses later, 
after he makes that declaration that I'm now going to be preaching the gospel of God, he makes a reflective statement in, in, in Romans 1.16. And he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the one I was preaching, but now the gospel of the faith only is all that matters, the eternal life. We're no longer qualifying for the other one. And, and how do we know that? Here, here's the definition. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for is it, a, it is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel of Christ was a salvation message. The gospel of God is a salvation message. But the one of the, of the gospel of Christ, it says, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. So we were talking about Jews. We were talking about keeping the law back here. This is, this is James time. This is faith without works is dead time. But then he introduces this, but now. The mystery, which was hidden, which was now revealed through Paul, this gospel of God, which now they're just saved through faith. They aren't going to get a physical reward. They're only going to get a spiritual reward, right? Yeah. Awesome. So another one uh, um, I, I love. Again, faith in Jesus Christ. It's so simple for eternal life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Does that say, well... If you believe on it, you might have. No, that you know that you have eternal life. Right? We don't need to get into this now, but, but I've got a slide later. But for so long, the Jews are like, man, they could backslide. They could fall away. They could do all these things. Why were, why were they backsliding and falling away? Because they were being measured by their works. No fornicator, no adulterer, no whoremonger. They, they couldn't do those things. And if they did those bad, evil, physical things, they're not getting everlasting life. They're not getting into the thousand years. So the, they could backslide because of physically doing something wrong. We can't backslide, folks. Believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. The only measurement of the simple of getting into eternal life, do you believe in Christ? Do you believe what he did on the cross? Now, there's a lot of other beliefs in the past. How was Moses saved? He wasn't saved like this. He didn't even know who Jesus Christ was. He didn't have the blood of Christ. He didn't have. So there have been a, 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 a number of different gospels all throughout Scripture. But ours, simple, believe on the name of Jesus Christ and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Okay? Conclusion, inherit eternal life in Christ by simply, like it said, the simplicity in Christ, by simply believing in Christ. But it's still your choice. I mean, like, like you said, it's still free will. Okay? So, once we believe and gain eternal life, can we lose our eternal life, salvation? Well, on the last slide here, we went through here, and, and no, I don't believe it says anything about losing it, but what verse cements that? Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after the, the, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, not of the eternal, not of the everlasting life salvation, but the eternal life salvation. It doesn't say that, I know, but the gospel of your salvation, eternal life, in whom also after that ye believed, one thing, ye were sealed. Are you more powerful than the seal of the Holy Spirit? Don't think so. Right? But keep in mind, 90% of this book is about losing your salvation, everlasting salvation, if you mess up physically. If you break a law, right? If the Jews messed up and broke the law, right? So don't think you're going to find a whole lot of verses. This is in a very narrow window in Scripture. Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, right? But we, through ours, through eternal life, we are sealed. We don't have to worry about what we do or don't do. Nothing we do can get us into eternal life. 
other than believe, and that's not really a do, it's not really a works, it's just a believe, it's just a thought, and nothing we can do can keep us out. When you consider the Apostle Paul and the, how far he had to come, um, it was a lot for him to probably acknowledge, even though it came from the Lord, you know. It, Paul was likely the m m most complete in intellect in, in the Jewish faith that the world has ever seen, possibly, okay? So he was a Jew of all Jews, you know, of, of the strictest sect, it says, you know, all those things, okay? Well, he claimed that before he was changed. Absolutely, be, right, before he, before he was presented with this gospel, the gospel of God, see, he preached, so from 34, 34 was kind of the, the road, you know, where he gets knocked down, sees the light, and his eyes need to be cleaned, whatever. And immediately after Paul, it's like in, in, in uh, Acts 9, 6, it says that he preached Christ. As soon as he got out, he preached Christ. Okay, Many people will say that that is when Paul received this gospel, and that's not true. Paul preached Jesus' gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, for 14 years starting out. Then he preached the one that Peter received in Acts 10 and in Acts 15, 7. Peter can reconfirms it again, which is the gospel of Christ. So gospel of the kingdom, gospel of Christ, both for 14 years. Then he was given this gospel, his gospel, at the beginning of Romans. So, so it, 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 you're right. He was changed. He was given this, this new gospel. But don't forget... Peter was given one before that. When Peter says, you know, in 15:7, uh, don't you know that a good while ago that God chose among us that I should that by my mouth, Peter's, that, that that the Gentiles should be saved. Peter was the first one who was saving Gentiles. But what does that really mean? That means that he was converting them over to Jews, so that they could qualify as a good works faith, Jewish faith, to get into that thousand years. Right, that didn't have to do with the eternal. We'll explain how it did have to do it, but it was all about get in to everlasting life. Better than a man not have his hand cut off your hand. Just get in the everlasting life. Poke your eye out. Get in. That's salvation. But we aren't talking about the everlasting. We're talking about eternal today, right? So we can go back a couple weeks ago. If you want to go back on the videos, that's great. Um, but we can explain it, you know, here too. Uh, Bible study, not Bible preaching. But anyway, we, after that we believe in the gospel of our salvation, not in Moses' salvation, but in ours, <laughs> right? We're sealed. Conclusion. When we believe, our eternal life salvation is sealed. Can't lose it like they could the everlasting one, based on works. So, where do we receive eternal life? Where is this going to be? Kind of know it's not in time. Kind of know that it's in Christ. But, but where do we receive it? Do we receive eternal life here when we die or at the end? Okay. Ephesians 2.5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Well, I'm sitting on a stool in Ellsworth, Iowa. I am not sitting together in heavenly places. So it sounds like the where is not here. <laughs> we don't get eternal life here we get the promise of it we're sealed with it but but we don't get it here we don't we don't actually take possession of it okay it's like having the title of your car and you have to do financing yeah you have the car but the deed the title is actually somewhere else and you get it once you complete something else we're going to get eternal life in heavenly places in Christ we're not going to get it when Christ comes back at the beginning of the thousand years, because that could also be in Christ. 
right? He'll be here, right? At the beginning of the thousand years. But that's not going to be in heavenly places. That's going to be here in earthly places. So the only place we can be in heavenly places in Christ is where we get eternal life, right? It's somewhere not on earth. So don't let anybody tell you that the thousand years is heaven on earth. No, it's not. That's that's no eye no eye has seen, no ear or he has heard the wonderful things that you know he has in store for those who love him. I'm not sure where that quote's at, but all right. So where do we experience it in heavenly places? When do we experience it? So when do we actually get it? We know we're promised it. We know we can't lose that promise. We're sealed. The Holy Spirit is sealing that today. But when do we actually when are we actually in Christ? 2 Corinthians 5:17. Therefore, if any man be where? In Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So it sounds like the when is. When old things are passed away, well, when's that? <laughs> at, at the end of everything, at the end of the time, when old things are passing away and new things are coming in, that's when the eternal is. For in Christ neither uh, circumcision availeth anything or uncircumcision, but a new creature. We will be a new creature. I don't even know what that means, so don't ask me, okay? I don't know what that means. What will, what we, what will we be, what will we look like in, in Christ? Well, we'll be a soul. I don't believe there'll be bodies, but certainly a new creature. Not a new creation. Sorry for anybody who's reading other Bibles. Not a new creation. God is not constantly creating things, okay? It's a new creature. So conclusion, we receive eternal life in Christ when old things are passed away. Well, Heath, you didn't give me much answers, but we sure did narrow it down, didn't we? To old things are passed away. Let's find out when are old things passed away. When do old things pass away? Well, apparently when we receive eternal life, when we're in Christ. But Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were... Well, there we go. At that time, at passed away time, we are going to be in Christ experiencing eternal life between the old heaven and earth passing away and the new heaven and earth being introduced, being made. Okay? So, it, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, actually, I do believe there's a gap. Uh, and again, I could be wrong, but think about this. As, as it reads the scripture, we should just turn to Revelation and read it as it reads through. But I think I might have it on, on, the, on the slide. can't remember. Two o'clock. Well, I think we started looking into this years ago because when, when we read, you haven't passed away. So where could we possibly be? Right. Where, where, there you go. And, and the answer, I believe, is, okay, old things, heaven and earth, all thoughts, all materials, all everything that we're in right now is going to be boop, gone. Then, I believe Scripture says, new heaven and new earth. Where is the portal between the old dying and the new will be in Christ. He, he exists outside of that time. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's the, they don't have to be overlapping. They don't have to be at the same time because they could be a thousand years apart. They're not, I don't believe, in any way, shape, or form. But they could be apart. But we can get from this where all these things are going to be gone. All thoughts, all spiritual things, all everything going to be gone. But we're in Christ. So we go, we, we move from that to this. Because we have that. Now, all the things that are not faith-only salvation, all those who do not have eternal life in Christ, where do they go? They don't go from the old heaven, old earth, into the new heaven, new earth. 
they're dissolved. Okay? And make make reasonable sense. Let's keep reading a few more verses. 2 Peter 3 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God where the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. So that's the last day we were just talking about. Day four, the day of God, the last day on earth. Okay, Everything shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look forward to, a, to new heavens and a new earth. Right? So this one dissolved, this one coming in. It doesn't say they don't have overlap here. I think it might be a little bit clearer in... in in uh, the ands in Revelation, so to speak. But Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Psh. Whatever happened over there uh, between us and, and a, uh, a neighboring farmer, whatever happened to us when they uh, operated on the wrong leg, whatever happened to us that somebody... Wrong, yeah. Nope. All that is dissolved. All that has gone away. All that heaven and earth, all the spiritual and all the physical that we experience today, all the thoughts that we experience today, gone. And then a new heaven and new earth. We won't remember non-believers. I don't believe we will. I don't believe in heaven we'll even remember non-believers. Um, I believe that Ecclesiastes, is it 12.7 or 12.5? I've gone through this, I can't remember. But it talks about when we die. Okay, so there are three things that make up when we die. If somebody, if somebody could look for Ecclesiastes, I can't remember how to find Ecclesiastes. So, But Ecclesiastes either 12.5 or 12.7, um, where it says that, that, that at, at that time when we die, that... Well, our bodies go back to the earth. That's pretty easy, right? I mean, we know that one, dust to dust, you know. But then it says, and our spirit returneth to God who gave it. So our spirit is, is what, what determines what we believe. Totally right. You're totally right. Lazarus, when he died, now again, we are crossing back over into the everlasting life, the qualifications based on doing good, not on belief only. But yeah, he was in hell. Lazarus was in hell. And, and, he, and uh, uh, he could see a, a great gulf between him, where right, where they couldn't cross, which would be a lower hell versus a, a, a I wouldn't say a higher hell. But that hell, if we think about when that actually happened in time, that was before Jesus died on the cross. That was before he forgave all sin. So technically, if, 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 if someone's sin wasn't forgiven, can they be in heaven? Nah. Right? There, there is no sin up there. There is no, there is no um, evil so to speak, that, that we can take with us as an unforgiven sin and get to heaven, right? And so, unfortunately, at that time, what was called Abraham's bosom um, was not in heaven because Christ had conquered death. So that Abraham's bosom, all the believers who had believed in God, their whole faith, their, their whole faith, their whole belief, was still in hell, it's not easy to believe that, but I believe it is, and we could explain it a little bit too. So I believe that all Abraham, Moses, um, Adam, I believe all those guys up until the time that Christ died were in a part of hell. To prove my point, not necessarily going into Scripture, but to prove my point, where did Jesus say... Or what did Jesus say um, when he died on the cross? When he was dying on the cross to the thief, he says, "Truly, today you will be with me in paradise." Right? Very clearly. But today, did he say to that guy hanging on the cross that truly in four days you'll be with me in paradise? This day. Th today, absolutely. 
So where was Jesus going for the next three days? To paradise, he said. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So where was paradise? Is my point to get back to your story of Lazarus. At that time, paradise had to be in a holding section. Now, it wasn't in hell. It wasn't in torment. It wasn't in separation. It was in the fact that they had not had their sins forgiven yet. And then once they had their sins forgiven, when Christ conquered all death and all sin on the cross, then what could he do? It says that he led captivity captive. And he took everybody, and think of like a big net, that he, he scoops them all up and says, you are the guys who believed in God. You are the guys who kept the law. You are the guys who did whatever. And now that your sins have been forgiven, I'm taking you guys that are in paradise up to heaven. So now paradise was in heaven. And today, paradise is in heaven. But at the time of Jesus dying, and before, paradise was in hell because their sins hadn't been forgiven. It was only remission of sins. Remember, John the Baptist said, hey, I'm coming bringing you a message of remission of sins. He, nobody's been forgiven yet. Nobody is actually getting to heaven yet. They're promised heaven, just like we're promised eternal life, but they hadn't gotten it for 2,000 years. 2067, Abrahamic, you know, covenant. Anyway, great questions. Where does the uh, great question. new earth come in? So, new earth and new heaven. All right, let's press on. I, I probably am not going to answer your question, but I'm going to intentionally not answer it because technically the new heaven and the new earth are not in the ages to come. The ages to come are still measured by time. And that new heaven and new earth are outside of time. So technically, they're not in this study. I don't want to be coy, but, but we know that at the time between this transition, between old heaven and old, and old earth and new heaven and new earth, we will all be in Christ and we will be experiencing in the heavenly places eternal life in Christ, right? Uh, let's see, I might have timed out. There we go. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. So we know that what we're on and where we're in and what we're thinking and all the things that are associated with it will pass away. But not his words. His words are outside of that, right? His words, the, the scripture was outside of it on our graph as well. So conclusion, the current heaven and earth will pass away. It'll be no more. The Lord God, Jesus Christ, will make the new heavens, new heaven and earth. Okay? So, back to this thing. When all this that's measured by time, in the beginning, heaven and earth, end of heaven and earth, right? Genesis 1.1, now what we're talking about, this is the fullness of time, is the last day. End of time. Eternal life. And I believe that this eternal life, and I've, I could have put new heaven and new earth. You'll see it out here. New heaven and visible above. New earth, visible and below. And a number of other things that pertain to the new heaven and the new earth. But since that is outside of our ages to come, we'll talk about that next time. If that's okay. But you're thinking everything will be destroyed. I believe everything will be either dissolved, might be more of the accurate term. I don't know that by fire necessarily, but certainly dissolved. Does that sound like heat? Maybe. It probably does. But I think even more so, consider this. Okay, so in the beginning, here, he created heaven and earth. Now, if I were to write up on the, the, if I had a whiteboard up here, and I used the term heaven and earth, and I did not capitalize them, would you assume I'm talking about a place or a state of, a state of being? I hope you'd think it was a state of being. Heaven is all the spiritual things. Earth is all the physical things. Eight verses later, or thereabouts, I, 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 I should turn there, but eight verses later, verse 
Yeah. Oh, uh, well, 10. No, 8. Yeah, 8. And in Genesis 1.8, it says, And God called the firmament heaven. But that's capitalized. We capitalize places. Right? The one in, in Genesis 1.1 is not capitalized. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's talking about, I created everything, guys. I created all things. I created, so here, we've, we've talked about this a number of times. But I use it, uh, let, let me refer to a, a game on TV called the Plinko game, okay? Where, where the ball bounces and you, now where am I going with this doggone Plinko story, okay? But I believe that in Colossians 1.16, it says that, that in the beginning, God created all things. If we go to Colossians 1.16, and it gives a definition of what Colossians calls all things. And here's what it is. Here's the definition of all things. For by him all, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Neither one of those are capitalized. It's talking about in a form, in a spiritual or in a physical. Okay. And then it goes on to say, for, for by him all things are created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Oh. So now, all things, heaven and earth, include all visible and all, all invisible things. Um, a tree, visible. I got that. That's easy to, to imagine that God created that, right? But is it easy for us to believe that God created all thoughts? The thought that you're having right now that you're like, hey, that Heath guy, he's a little bit nuts. I don't know this. I believe that God created that in the, in, in the year 4004 BC. He created every thought. He created Einstein didn't, didn't, he did not found E equals MC squared. He, 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 didn't, he, didn't, he didn't establish it. He found it. He researched it. He whatever else like that. But in 4004 BC, I believe that God created all things, both visible and invisible. And I would call a thought invisible. So I believe every thought you've ever had has never been your own original thought. I believe that God has 86 trillion round numbers, okay? 86 trillion thoughts that he's put into every one of our heads that we could contemplate at some time. That's how big of a God I think we worship. So when we have free will, what's that? Move on. Oh, the, yeah. So, yeah, so when, we, when we move on to the Plinko game, if he's created every thought and he's created every scenario where if you folks drive out of here to the left, you head back into Ellsworth, maybe you go over and get some ice cream over in Radcliffe, okay? But he's seen the outcome of either. He created all things. Not just the things that are happening, but the many things that could happen, right? But he's not directing you to one or the other. And it looks like it's an unlimited free will everything. No, he's created all of them. And it is a finite, although it looks infinite to us, but it is a finite number of options that now we have the ability to choose. I struggled for 40 years. I've shared this before maybe, but struggled for 40 years at least with this concept. How can God be an all-knowing God yet allow free will? If he's all-knowing, it's not really free will because he, he knows it, right? And so it's, it's the, it's the, I think this Plinko game solves it in the fact that now I acknowledge God created all things. He created evil. It says that in Scripture. I could find the verse if we need to, okay? He creates evil. Now, that's not saying he's creating evil and forcing somebody to do it. He's creating evil so that there's an option for me to choose this, like... Oh, that would get me a lot more money or a lot more satisfaction or a lot more physical lust or a lot more. And yet, because he created it, and yet I choose to, to follow him. I think he loves, he, he lavishes in that, I think. That knowing that the, the, the physically rewarding things we are bypassing just to, to choose him. But without that choice... 
being what he created, the evil, the pornography. I'm sorry, but he created all things so that we, as believers, could choose him. Right? So, so if, if, if everything leading up to this was actually his thought, his action, his what he already saw in 4004 BC, he created all things in the beginning. Now it makes the, the, oh, well, why did Adam and Eve choose? Why did God have them choose? God didn't have them choose. He knew what was going to happen if, if Eve partook of the, uh, the knowledge of, of the tree of, of good and evil or of the tree of life. And he did not control that one either. He knew what would happen. He knew we were getting to this eternal life in Christ, in him, right? He knew that was going to be a possibility. He set up this, this whole Plinko game. He set up the whole thing. How crazy of an awesome, unbelievable God that knows all things because he created every path that could ever happen or, and yet says, you choose. Wow. Every temptation. Yeah, every one of them he created. Otherwise, we have to give someone else the credit for creating something. And that is not going to happen ever in, in a Bible study that I'm associated with. The devil can't create things and he can't make things. Now he can form things. Sure. So getting back to your... your the Lord's Prayer, it leads us not into mm -hmm. God is sovereign over every little detail. True, and he has created... Let me ask you this. Again, we're going down great rabbit holes. This is what Bible studies should be like, right? I, I believe the interaction and asking. So I believe that there are, if, if I believe that God created all things, so every thought, every action, every everything, right? Whether that's, whether you believe that or whether you don't, that's, oh, it's okay. But I, since I do, then I have, to, I have to come up with what I think are three different scenarios that exist in the world today, okay? God is in control of all things. God is in control of nothing. Or I shouldn't say that. God is controlling all things. God is controlling nothing. Or God is controlling some things. Is it fair to say that there's really not a fourth option? It's like all, some, or none, right? There, there's, not a, there's not a fourth option, really. So let's, let's explore, if we may, that God is controlling all things. So this, let's, let's eliminate what we think. If God is controlling all things today, no disrespect to God, but he is doing a horrible job. <laughs> okay? So, so I'm not saying he can't control all things, keep in mind. But is he? Right. He... He allows for sure. something. For sure. And if those allowings are wrong, like what we are experiencing in life now, <laughs> he gives us a and makes us, he, he has a thing that could happen that makes us then go the path that he wanted us to. Sure. And, well, we finally got it. Yeah, right. So let's think even outside of ourselves and I give this example and it's kind of a crass example but is God controlling a little girl in India who gets sexually abused every day by her keepers is is he controlling it nah. no he's not controlling it right and so is it fair to say at least from our standpoint for discussion here that God could be but he is not controlling everything he's not conducting those men to do that to that little girl. Fair? Right. Just, just like God allowed the devil to do things to Job. Yes. He allowed the devil to do things. He allows the bad people in India. He allows things. But nah, you're not going to go against what he's got planned. Right. And so I think, as well, to, to trumpet on that, the Job thing. I believe that if we believe that God created all things in the beginning, thanks for joining us, that in the beginning, that God actually knew that the Job 
challenges and the Job confrontation by the devil and him testing Job and everything else like that, I believe that God created those scenarios to maybe they would come into play. Maybe they wouldn't, right? Okay, and, and again, or the devil created them. And I'm not giving the devil, devil any of that credit. God created those things, right? So, so if God created those things, then he can control them or he cannot control them. So I believe that he created, but he's not controlling. Fair to say? So now we kind of knocked out one side of is God controlling? He's not controlling all things. Okay, let's go on to the next step. Is God controlling some things that are happening here today? <sighs> Unfortunately for me, that's the hardest one for me to accept if God is controlling some things. Because if he's controlling some things, he allowed this mother of six to die of cancer at age 28, but yet he healed this mother of six. So now God, again, we prayed for them both. So now God is picking and choosing. Oh man, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that God is arbitrarily. Well, I don't know how else to explain it. He created all things. He knows every instance. And yet he chooses at this time to intervene or this time to apparently allow the bad. Uh, again, I, I don't know the answers to this, but what I, what I tend, and I, I love talking about this. So if anybody can shed light on it, whether you be on the internet, whether you be here, I, I just have to believe, I think, that God, in his sovereignty, he created, I, I think he created a thousand different scenarios where I would be presented with salvation. Because he present, he created all the scenarios, so of course he's going to have a dozen or two or or five thousand of them where I was presented and said, "Hey Heath, you know what? If you just simply believe, man, right?" And so I don't believe that anybody out anybody in the world. I believe that since God's in control of the instances and the thoughts and the what, that I believe that every man and it says in Scripture that everyone has been offered salvation. Okay. And eternal salvation, specifically, not, not everlasting. But I have to believe that he created the Plinko. But either he's controlling all of it, controlling some of it, uh, allowing the little girl to be attacked again and again and again without intervening, or he's controlling none of it. it and I think in my mind, I've, I've certainly counted out the first two. He's an all-knowing, sovereign, created all things God. But if he's not intervening in that little girl in India in her prayer, I probably should not be saying, oh, God blessed me with this today. Because I have to, in the same breath, just separated by a little comma, say, but God cursed that little girl. Yikes. And, and we think, we're, I mean, we're so fortunate here. We're so fortunate where we are, uh, it, it, not, not only in America, but within central Iowa and everything. We're like, man, God is just pouring down blessings on us. And He created all thoughts and actions and whatever's like that. We're making of it what he gave us as the parameter to conduct ourselves within. And if we have favor, it's favor that we've brought on to ourselves by worshiping God, clearing our minds, daily renewing our minds, you know, Romans 12, 2 kind of stuff, rather than, huh, God just likes me. He's just favoring me. I'm blessed all the time. Well, of course you're blessed all the time. You're still breathing. <laughs> but, but, but for us to say that we're, anyway. But, so. And it's that type of word usage of we're so blessed here, we're this, we're that, to young people especially, it's such hypocrisy that is making them not want to search out Christ. Yeah, they don't want to search out how simple it is. And, and so. Well, I mean, they, they see that as just, 
Yeah, right. they, they see it, they know it, and so they can't just jump on board when people are saying, oh, you need to believe in this or Christ or this, because that, that doesn't smell right. Right. Because they're not seeing the blessings necessarily. Right. They're not seeing they're the seeing blessings, or they're, or they're saying, well, seeing. that's a God who is picking and choosing. Yeah. Or, so that can't be, I mean, they, they can think beyond that. And so our wording, I think, matters because maybe we do feel blessed, but in the same sense, like you're saying, yeah, one one of the biggest call. Oh, go ahead. Until we go to Ephesians one three and see what it says about blessings. Yeah, yeah. Where where are blessings being given? Bless in all heavenly places, right? And Not using it strictly as earthly. Usually, when they say that, and then yeah, like yeah. Said, now let's not lose sight. How? What percentage of our Bible is there? Spiritual blessings, <laughs> maybe 5% in our gospel, because they were being blessed, and they were told they're being blessed to Jews. If you do my commandments, if you follow my word, I will bless thee. I will bless Israel, I will, right? And even the people who, who, who weren't Israel, but did good things to Israel, were blessed. And God was intervening. He was intervening. Yeah. Right, but we're saying, but now... But now, in the but now time period, the mystery in this gospel of God where it's faith only, where we're perfect, where it's eternal life only, where Paul only speak, spoke, preached. God's not, I don't believe, blessing or cursing based on our doing. He is not rewarding based on our works. I think we saw that verse, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He's only rewarding based on our faith. That simplicity in Christ that it talked about in 2 Corinthians. Now, blessings occurred all throughout the Bible. So don't say that, oh, well, he said there's no blessing. At this time in our gospel that's only measured by spiritual For sure. It's spiritual result. It's just a earthly, earthly You're going to have a miserable life if you kill someone. It, it, the, the, the Jewish law says you kill someone, you're not getting into everlasting life. Ours says you kill someone, does, do our work save us? Or we're, no. It just says you're going to jail. We're going to have a horrible life here. But it's not about salvation. It was about the Jews' salvation. I, I said this, and I even was watching a video that I gave a, a, a year or two ago in Ellsworth at the men's Bible study. Um, I believe that you folks, you, 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 are better people because you have chosen to follow God. You have chosen to believe in Christ. You have chosen to do good things but if you do bad things those works are not affecting your salvation so so you cheating somebody on a, a business deal on, on a farm selling your grain what however it be moving a zero on, in an accounting you know for your boss those things are not about salvation <laughs> They're just, you're a rotten person if you do them. But it has, doesn't matter about your salvation. The Jews had to be ethical in the business. It was commanded in the law. So they didn't have to, or we don't have to be good. We choose to be good. They had to be good or they lose their salvation. <laughs> right? Lose it. So I, I wouldn't say the Jewish law made good men. It, it had a stick that made good men and says, you don't do this, whap. No everlasting life for you. Okay. Is this on? It is, yeah. So if you'd rather, we can ask questions not on the video completely, whatever you'd like. Yeah. So next week, what is the new heaven and the earth? We know that in that time where this old thing that we're in versus the new thing. 
Now I put on a bunch of additional more info one, more info two, and more info three. We're not gonna go over this, but just so you know, it's on the handout there and it'll be um, on the slide presentation that's online. But in the yellow, it talks about everlasting life versus in the blue, it talks about eternal, okay? Justified by his grace, believeth in him, eternal, immortal, invisible. Here it's talking about Israel shall be saved, um, but if they've forsaken the houses, the brethren, the sisters, the fathers, then they'll get in everlasting life. This is talking about all the physical, being saved by doing things, by works, right? This is just talking about belief, okay? Here's a, a, another little slide that I put together, and I can't remember for what, but comparing everlasting life to eternal life. Everlasting life, physical, works, following commandments. Could you use, lose it? It's visible. It's here. Only the Jews. During the thousand-year kingdom is when they receive it. Uh, uh, everlasting is the, is the uh, name of the thousand years, and it's the reconciliation or the reward here on earth. Because what are the Jews going to do? They're going to rule with Christ with, for a thousand years. It says it. This one says we're getting ours at the end of time. We're sealed right now, but we're getting eternal life. It's spiritual. It's belief. It's grace. You can't lose it. It's invisible. It's offered to all, right? All in your handout. So last one. It's fun, it's fun for me to see. Well, why, why have I never been told about this everlasting qualification of life? Because at the end, we've talked about that, but the Jews will get the eternal life. We'll explain how. But, but this everlasting life, in John 6.40 and John 6.54, that's just 14 verses apart. It's talking about both salvations, both lives, okay? And this is the will of, of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will ra raise him up, when? The last day. When will this guy, who is saved by everlasting life, be, be raised up and be rewarded on the last day in Christ. At the dispensation of the fullness of times, I will gather together earth and I will gather together heaven. I will gather together the physical salvation and the spiritual one, the eternal. Okay? Who says the exact same thing? Hath eternal life and I will rise him up. I'm going to put them all together. Ephesians 1.10, in the dispensation of fullness times, you will gather together in Christ. Right? At this time. Both the way of the salvation of this gospel that's in the blue, this gospel that's in the purple, those are all works, salvations. These gospels here, if you live through the seven-year tribulation and you were a Jew, you live through the seven-year tribulation, you'd be a tribulation saint. You'd be uh, right here. And, but all these, whether you say you're saved by your works or the, whether you're just saved like us by our belief, all going to be gathered together on the last day. So eternity, eternal, the eternal life, what is it? It is not physical, it is spiritual has nothing to do with rewards physically. It's simple, consisting of one thing. Simply believe Christ forgave all sin on the cross. When we believe our soul is sealed until we receive eternal life. The when. At the dispensation of the fullness. At, at the time when the old is going out and the new is coming in, we will be in Christ. After time is ended, we will receive eternal life. Where? In heavenly places. Not at the beginning of the thousand years. Not, not once we die, we get eternal life. That's a m common misperception. We don't get eternal life until the last day when we are in him. We're promised it. Can't lose that promise. But eternity, I believe, is not a time. It is a place. It is in Christ. And who? All believers, both in heaven and on earth. Right? Eternal life in Christ. I think that's it. Yeah.
Thanks.